In this episode, we'll hear from Paul Hackett about Tibetan dictionaries. Paul is a scholar of Buddhist studies whose expertise includes computational linguistics, which he uses to analyze canonical Buddhist texts in languages such as Tibetan, Sanskrit, and Chinese. Paul has taught Tibetan language courses at Columbia, Yale, and online, and is the author of several books in the field of Tibetan and Buddhist studies, including a Tibetan language primer and a Tibetan verb lexicon. Today, Paul will talk to us about how to use Tibetan dictionaries um, for, for your own specific research purposes, which ones to use and where to look for terms that can be very difficult to find. He'll talk about bilingual and monolingual and online dictionaries. He'll give us a really great set of tips on Tibetan study aids that goes beyond um, the typical dictionaries that uh, most of us might use in our research. And um, he'll talk about what to do when you really cannot find a word and he'll end with some best practices in research related to specialized terminology and how to build your own lexicon of terminology relevant to your own research. Hello. Today I'll be talking to you about Tibetan dictionaries, what they are, and how to use them to your greatest benefit. Although all of us likely assume that we know what dictionaries are and how to use them, in general, it is important to remember that dictionaries are not absolute authorities. They are the product of human scholars and are only as good as the scholars who compile them and are only as relevant as the sources from which they were compiled. In this talk, I will talk to you about Tibetan dictionaries, including Tibetan English dictionaries and Tibetan Tibetan dictionaries, as well as online resources, what to do when those resources are inadequate, and finally, some dictionary-related best practices for your own research. The first thing to be aware of is there is no single authoritative or comprehensive source dictionary for working with Tibetan texts. As a student or scholar of Tibetan, you will need to have more than one dictionary at your disposal, but it is important to familiarize yourself with the variety that exist and their limitations. If you have worked with Tibetan dictionaries, you are aware of the sort order commonly used for Tibetan, consisting of the root letter, followed by vowels and suffixes, then root letters with subscripts, followed by vowels and suffixes, then root letters with prefixes, and so on. It is important to be aware, however, that this system for sorting Tibetan words did not come into existence until the 19th century. It was invented by Isaac Schmidt and presented in his Grammar and Dictionary in the 1830s, and it was Sarat Chandra Das who expanded on Schmidt's work some 50 years later that led to widespread adoption of this system. If you consult other Tibetan dictionaries produced during the 19th and 20th centuries, you will discover that they do not follow this alphabetization scheme and instead typically sort words in straight letter sequence. I mention this because these dictionaries still have some usefulness and occasionally will contain entries and translations not found in other dictionaries. Consequently, for a beginning student in Tibetan studies, Sarat Chandra Das's Tibetan English Dictionary remains the best all-purpose dictionary to have been published. Sarat Chandra Das was a British spy in India at the end of the 19th century, and was the person thinly fictionalized by Rudyard Kipling as Hari Chunder Mukherjee in his thinly fictionalized novel, Kim, about British espionage in the Indian subcontinent. And just like the rotund Bengali of Kipling's novel, Das traveled in disguise as a Buddhist pilgrim in southern Tibet, accompanied by a Tibetan lama, who provided him with a wealth of information on the Tibetan language. Consequently, Das's dictionary contains a good balance of both religious and mundane terms, with occasional notes on their colloquial use. Indeed, I find myself still consulting it from time to time for obscure words and usages. There are readily available Indian reprints of this dictionary, however the print can be occasionally hard to read, especially for Sanskrit words. For a while, however, there was a very nice reproduction edition available, published in Japan by Kodansha. Tony Duff has also released an electronically searchable version of Das's dictionary, although it unfortunately omits the Sanskrit equivalents. Other dictionaries that might be of use from time to time are Alexander Chomedekoros' Tibetan English Dictionary, 
which contains a large number of common expressions, proper names, and euphemisms from his survey work on the Tibetan canon. Similarly, George Rorick's Tibetan Russian English Dictionary in 10 volumes can occasionally be useful for certain words. Although Rorick based his dictionary on Chandra Das's vocabulary, he supplemented it over the years based on his historical research with the noted Tibetan scholar Gedan Chupel and terms found in later publications, such as Geshe Chodrak's Tibetan Dictionary, published in the 1950s. For students specifically interested in Buddhist terminology, there are fortunately some good resources. The first is an updated version of the oldest Tibetan dictionary, the Mahavyutpadi, a 9,000-plus entry glossary of translation equivalents compiled in the 8th century. As a translation glossary, a large number of entries are proper names, although it contains a fair amount of Buddhist technical terms and Sanskrit common words as well, many of which Sarat Chandra Das included in his dictionary. In addition to the canonical version, there have been several editions and translations published over the last two centuries. Alexander Choma de Koros published an English translation in serialized form with the Royal Asiatic Society of Bengal in the early 20th century, which was then reproduced as a single volume in the 1980s in Budapest. A two-volume Japanese edition in Sanskrit, Tibetan, Chinese, and Japanese, with Sanskrit and Tibetan term indexes, was published in the 20th century with several reprints available. A related resource is Tsepak Rigzin's Tibetan English Dictionary of Buddhist Terminology, published from the LTWA, which was derived from the Mahavyutpati and supplemented by expanded term definitions and additional entries from Buddhist philosophy courses taught at the Library of Tibetan Works and Archives in Dharamsala. The other major resource for specifically Buddhist terminology is Geoffrey Hopkins' Tibetan Sanskrit English Dictionary, compiled from the translation work of Hopkins and his students, available freely online as a searchable PDF at uma-tibet.org. While another dictionary of use for Buddhist and classical language texts, is Hackett's Tibetan Verb Lexicon, now in its second edition. One of the strengths of both Hopkins and Hackett's dictionaries is that they were compiled from Buddhist canonical and post-canonical sources, and so contain a fair amount of foundational vocabulary in Buddhist philosophy. There also exist a number of monolingual Tibetan dictionaries, each with their own strengths and weaknesses. As monolingual resources, they are of limited use to students early in their studies. But once your facility with the Tibetan language improves, you can begin to make use of monolingual Tibetan dictionaries, and they can be useful for locating terms not found in bilingual dictionaries. The earliest contemporary monolingual Tibetan dictionary proper was Geshe Chodrak's dictionary, currently available in reproduction of the original 1949 Lhasa edition, and the 1957 Beijing edition with Chinese translations. Geshe Chodrak was a frequent visitor to Kalimpong and worked with Tarchim Babu on the publications of the Tibet Mirror Press, including the Tibet Mirror newspaper, the near entirety of which is now available online at Columbia University. Related to Geshe Chodrak's dictionary was Tarchim Babu's dictionary, which Geshe Chodrak apparently drew upon, although this dictionary remained unpublished and only one archival copy is known to exist, currently housed at Columbia University's East Asian Library Special Collections. The dictionary itself is somewhat odd in that a large number of entries appear to be loanwords from Lepcha, Hindi, and Urdu that formed the common vernacular of mid-20th century Kalimpong, while much of the vocabulary that Tarchin used in his Tibet Mirror newspaper is surprisingly missing. Nonetheless, Tarchin's dictionary appears to be a valuable resource for 20th century colloquial Tibetan of the border regions and is deserving of additional study. It is hoped that one day a digital reproduction may become available. As for publications within Tibet and China, after the end of the Cultural Revolution in China and Tibet in 1975, it would be another 10 years before Tibetan publications in the PRC would even begin to resume, and even then slowly. One of the earliest Tibetan Tibetan Chinese dictionaries published during this period was the Tsiksu Chemo, or Great Tibetan Chinese Dictionary, initially in three large volumes and later in a two volume compact edition. A project to translate and publish this dictionary 
was begun in the 1990s at the School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS, in London, and a draft translation completed. However, negotiations between the translators and the copyright holder of the Tibetan original over intellectual property rights of the translation broke down, and only the first volume, roughly one-third of the dictionary, was ever published. It is unclear if and when the remainder will be published. A similar monolingual dictionary published in the PRC in the early 2000s was the Dunkar Dictionary. The Dunkar Dictionary is more encyclopedic than a normal dictionary, and like the Tsiksuchemo, the Dunkar Dictionary contains extensive biographical entries and long Tibetan phrases that would normally not be found in a proper dictionary. The 1990s also saw the publication of a number of smaller, subject specialty monolingual Tibetan dictionaries, such as medical terminology, legal terminology, common vernacular terms, archaic terminology, and other such subject-specific glossaries. In addition, there are other specialized Tibetan dictionaries being published outside of India and the PRC. One of particular note is Izumi Hoshi's Tibetan Dictionary of Pastoralism, which contains a number of illustrations of common pastoral terms that would not be found in a general purpose dictionary. In addition to these traditional lexical resources, it is worth mentioning that there are some electronic and online Tibetan dictionary resources as well, with their own strengths and weaknesses. The most significant of these is the Munlam Dictionary, compiled under the direction of Geshe Munlam from Sarame Monastic University in South India, and available for desktop computers and mobile devices. The dictionary is available in both the Google Play and Apple App Stores. The dictionary consists of a progressive intelligent search function with explanatory definitions and examples, and is, on the whole, carefully curated and well-constructed. Likewise, Tony Duff's Illuminator Electronic Dictionary is a commercial product from the Padma Karpo Translation Committee in Kathmandu, available for iOS mobile devices, and is a Tibetan English translation dictionary with lengthy explanatory entries. The otherwise most readily available online resource for Tibetan dictionaries, and seemingly the most popular, is the THL Dictionary Tool from the University of Virginia, which, unfortunately, is also possibly the worst of the online resources. This is due primarily to its inclusion of the Rangcheng Yeshe translation glossary, which is poorly curated, riddled with errors, and often contains highly idiosyncratic or questionable translations. The THL dictionary tool combines a variety of glossaries and dictionaries, including an early version of the Hopkins dictionary, under a single interface combined with a maximum length search function. Unfortunately, the results offer no sense of domain or subject matter applicability, nor any examples of word usage, and my experience in working with students who have attempted to use it for their translations and study is that it produces misleading, if not completely wrong, results. Consequently, I actively discourage its use and encourage students instead to resort to traditional dictionaries. Sometimes, when working on a translation, the word you're looking for simply cannot be found, or if found, has a translation that seems inaccurate or inadequate at conveying the full meaning of a term. In such instances, you will need to go beyond simple dictionary usage to larger textual resources. Fortunately, there are a number of genres of Tibetan literature that can aid in this. One of the most readily accessible genres of literature for familiarization with the vocabulary of a topic is the monastic textbooks genre, or yikcha. They often contain pairs of texts, such as general meaning presentations and decisive analyses commentaries on a subject. Many of these exist in searchable electronic form and can be easily used to locate term usage and contextual explanations. Similarly, for many subjects in Tibetan studies, there are authors who have composed commentaries explaining difficult words in an authoritative root text. Such commentaries might be called personal instructions, mengak, or commentaries on difficult points, gane, 
and will often contain longer explanations of an unusual term or phrase used by an author. Finally, a distinctive feature of Buddhist philosophy is its use of hierarchical lists of things. There is another genre of literature, enumeration of phenomena, chuginamjong, that provide lists of these, and publications continue to come forth in this genre, some with English translations, if not Sanskrit and Hindi as well. Two such recent publications are Sanjib Kumar Das's Basic Buddhist Terminology and J.S. Nagy's Dharma Sangraha Kosha, Tibetan Sanskrit Dharma Terms with Categories. Sometimes Tibetan resources may not be enough, and it is necessary to resort to other languages. When you come across a word that you don't recognize, or even one that you do, but which makes no sense in context, the failure to locate the word in a dictionary could mean that it is simply an obscure, undocumented word. However, there are alternatives that you should also consider. Is it a spelling mistake on the part of the author or scribe who copied the manuscript? Verbs, verb tenses, and their spellings are often mistaken, or homophone errors can occur when a text was dictated for copying, and so forth. Look for alternate versions of the same text, or other instances of the same phrase in a different text, some of which might also have a Sanskrit parallel. Is it an archaic word from an early translation period? Look for commentaries that might gloss the word with a synonym. Is it a metaphor or reference to a story in Tibetan or Indian culture that you are unfamiliar with? Canonical texts and post-canonical commentaries often contain such references to what, at the time of composition, were well-known stories. Otherwise, is it just a bad translation by the translator? Believe it or not, some translators make mistakes reading a source text and make bad decisions in vocabulary choice in the target language. In which case, if the original language text is still extant, you should consult it, and if not, you should attempt to reconstruct or hypothesize the source term in the original language and give thought to other possible meanings of that source language term that might make more sense in that context. You can do this by consulting a Sanskrit dictionary such as Edgerton or Monier Williams, or a Chinese dictionary, such as Chuck Mueller's Digital Dictionary of Buddhism, all of which are searchable online. A final strategy, if all these other approaches fail, is to explore the larger body of Tibetan and Sanskrit literature. But this is a sufficiently large topic that it should be treated separately. Finally, we can talk about some best practices in research related to dictionaries. No matter what project you are engaged in, you should probably maintain your own glossary of unique words. There are several ways to do this. You can maintain a simple word processing document containing unique words or common words with a unique sense, create a spreadsheet to manage your vocabulary list and associated information, or you can maintain this information in a structured database, such as FileMaker Pro. This last approach is the one that I have used in my research. All of these methods, however, will suffice, since the basic principles of lexicography remain the same. Basically, when you encounter a word or technical phrase that has a distinct meaning in the context of your text, you should document it. This means not just noting the word in your chosen translation, but your justification for it, either in terms of an equivalent in another language, or an etymology, or a definition found in a text. Most important of all, however, is that you include an example sentence of your word and chosen translation in context with a citation to your source text. So for example, you could do this in a word processing document. If your goal is to provide a glossary for a published translation, the approach of using a simple word processing file might suit your needs. If you're working on a series of related texts, a single comprehensive glossary might be more appropriate allowing you to easily locate unique words that reappear in your selected corpus. In such a case, a spreadsheet might be the easiest solution. If, however, 
you have the goal of producing a comprehensive glossary of words that you or a team of translators might wish to consult over a long-term period of time, then a structured database might be the approach you wish to take. A structured database is relatively easy to create and has the advantage that one can add fields for certain types of data that might only occasionally be of use to note and search for. Another advantage is that it can be easily scaled to accommodate extensive amounts of data. For example, as I mentioned, this approach was used in the creation of a database for my Tibetan verb lexicon. And as a result, that database has several hundred data fields that each contain different types of data, some of which one might only wish to store temporary information in for later completion, as in example three in this image, in which an occurrence in a text is noted, but the example sentence has not yet been input. In addition, because the data is structured, subsets of the data can be exported for different needs, from a simple translation glossary to a full dictionary with examples suitable for publication. Thanks for listening. I hope this has been useful in informing your understanding of the use and utility of Tibetan dictionaries.